What's going on, everybody? This is James Grandmaster Facts Boys, and you're here for another episode of the Facts Project. Today, special guest, multiple guests for probably the fourth or fifth time. <laughs> Wingless Comics, Brian Lambert. Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me, as always. I was going to say the same thing, man. I can't do a, a campaign or a comic without coming on here. Bro. It just wouldn't feel right at this point. I, and you know what? I'm all for it because with me being someone that indebted into all of your characters only makes this a little bit more special because, like, I, I honestly feel like I know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I, I so I was watching a you did an interview with a Lawrence King maybe maybe like a year ago, right? Like, yeah, about uh, eviction Bellum and stuff. And so one of the things that I mean, I, I tell you, I told you this before. But one of the things about you and coming on this show, this show in particular is uh, the fact that you actually do the research. Like a lot of shows you go on, they'll talk to you. Maybe they've gotten your press release. Maybe they've seen something, but they don't really know anything about the book or the stories or whatever. So it's it's not hard to chat, but it's hard to chat about what you're passionate about without just a sales pitch. You know what I mean? Like you can't geek out on the characters because they don't know them. Uh, so it's cool to come here. It's like, oh man, he's read the thing. He's gonna ask me some questions that I may not have gotten from other people. So we could again talk about the characters. I don't know. I love getting into that stuff. That's why I create, not because of the money, but because of like, I like these stories, bro. Yeah. And the way that you basically screenwrite a lot of these characters only makes it that more succeeding because there is so many characters to follow and the personalities that are attached to them just brings forth this this universe. I mean, no, you, you literally have a collaboration project, which was one of one of your first projects which was nightfall and that mm -hmm. that had a slew of characters so it was only right that you had the ability to have conversation pieces conflict pieces with multiple characters at the same time which is rare for a lot of people you know especially i'm gonna say like right like what, what i find a lot of times is that um and, I, and i've been critical of this in the past you meet a creator and the creator is always like oh i got 100 characters and i got this whole thing just like marvel and I'm not saying that as creative people, we don't have that and that person doesn't have that. But it's very difficult to, to, to develop and it's also very difficult to make people care. One of the better critiques or, or comments that I got about something like Nightfall was um, when people started reading it, they thought like Justice was gonna be out in the front, he was gonna do everything cool. He was gonna be Vin Diesel in you know, the Fast and the Furious movies. He does everything. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very important that that wasn't the case. I remember you and I talking when number three hit Mm -hmm. when you first see her the first time and you were like man I didn't think justice was gonna go out like that and I didn't think her was gonna get to shine like that and it was I feel like that's always the point I feel like balancing those characters is what's fun mm -hmm. if justice just watches everybody then what's the but yeah I, I don't find that's... that to be engaging at all right like I want to see where whereas yeah maybe he could have right like even in the setup of the story he's like hey just give me a second I've got to, you don't know what he's got to do, but he's like, give me a second, right? Yep. So in his mind, oh, I'm about to, I'm about to wax this dude. And then somebody else comes out of nowhere and takes him out. And then her is the one who gets to do it. Or Avery being the one when justice is chained, you know what I mean? Going down and smashing the chains and then going up to fight the, fight the big bad. I feel like balancing all of that is what's important. And I also feel like that's something that's missing from like modern cinema. I mean, again, if we're talking about Fast and the Furious, if we're talking about even Star Wars or some of these things, you get one character that's got to do like everything in order to show that they're dope. And it's like, well, if they're dope, you don't have to show everybody. They're just, it's just going to happen. They're going to be dope and they don't have to take every heroic moment right. from other people. No, no. Um, and, and, that, so that's, that's, that's important. and that's totally viable. It's kind of like, of course, anything with justice league, it was like, as soon as the Kryptonian shows up, Oh, it's just going to be all hell to break right. loose. Like nobody else gets to shine. That's probably why ba Batman right. hates him so much, but, that's right. just right. Like it. <laughs> right right and so that was actually one of the things that even though i did like Zack snyder's cut of the justice league yeah that was one of the things that i hated superman comes back and i get it he's in the black suit it looks cool but he washes steppenwolf right steppenwolf has gone through all of the amazons by this point yeah he's beating up wonder woman right he's beating up Aquaman. they're all fighting him and superman just comes and like flicks the dude basically and it's a <laughs> that that's so it was that was so lame to me, you know what I mean? And I'm not saying Superman's not crazy powerful. And I've read enough comics. If Superboy Prime comes in and does that, you're like, yeah, because he went through the entire Green Lantern Corps right. by himself. You know what I mean? Like, he, they got these other feats. 
But if you have, again, what's the danger? If Superman could watch Steppenwolf like that, you telling me he struggled pulling mother boxes apart? Like that doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? And like it just, I don't know, it feels lackluster to me, right? And then if you watch Steppenwolf like that, then how is Darkseid a threat? Because Darkseid got beat by the Amazons and Zeus to them in the beginning. So how is he threatening right. at this point? He looked over, and he did the thing, but like, is he a physical threat? That's one of the reasons Thanos had to beat up Hulk, right? Like Thanos had to wash Hulk. Well, he didn't have to, but narratively it made sense. Yeah. He watches Hulk, who was the guy all of them had to team up to fight. So then when he comes down to the planet and he's waxing everybody, you're like, well, he did. You know what I'm he did be <laughs> he, he Hulk. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So narratively, even if even if people didn't like it, which I get, because like Hulk got beat down, but like it made and it would have made even more narrative sense if they didn't have the time jump where he becomes Professor Hulk. If he really had to work through mm -hmm. turning back into the Hulk and why, and we had if we got a chance to see that part of it, it would have made even more narrative sense. And you're like, oh, they really are battling, and Hulk did get beat up, and he's scared now. Like yeah. it would have been dope because then that brings out all his childhood problems and the trauma, and you know what I mean. Like, Layers on top of layers. If you're if you're able to do that, and I think that it takes a a nuanced storytelling to do that in in comics and with superheroes and with fantasy, because it's very easy. Okay, it's easy to write Peter Jackson's Legolas from the Lord of the Rings movies. Easy. The dude mm -hmm. shoots arrows. He be jumping on stuff. He can bounce on anything. He dope. But it's very very difficult to write Aragorn, who's a fighter. But he's also super compassionate and he loves his friends and will say it and will cry with people. You know what I mean? Like that part is is the more difficult yeah. aspect of the character development. Yeah. Um, and I think it gets glossed over again, especially in comics, especially in superhero comics. And where I'm fortunate is mine gets to be a fantasy superhero comic. You know what I mean? Like so it's like more of the dark fantasy genre. True. Um, and so it makes it a I, in my that's that's where I love to play. So it makes it a little bit easier for me. But it also helps me when I'm trying to develop other people and I'm editing for the the people who I edit for to like bring this piece out, you know, of who their character is and why their character is and and, and what makes it cool and the interactions that make it cool. That's true. That's true. Now, to dive deep, of course, you're about like two weeks into your Kickstarter. Um, of course I had to go back and read good old justice number three over here a few times before we, before we got a, ch a chance to chat, but, um, to get more into this, of course, there was a, a very quintessential cliffhanger at the end of justice three that leads us exactly to where we are now. Mm -hmm. Justice of course is pretty much, uh, taking his, taking his reins of going, going back uh, to, to his roots, meeting some people that he's knew, known from his past and everything like that. And ultimately, it turns out may, it may have been a ploy uh, to lure him away and to cause a little bit of, uh, of drama in order for him. Of, of course, him going there and finding out exactly what Volante's power scale is and that he would have to need it in a certain fashion was ultimately his choice of going going back. But yet, it was a setup. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, all of it's a setup, right? Like oh. okay, any, any story, right? Any story, everything's a right. setup for whatever happens the next piece. What is important about what we're learning here is that, and what Justice's real journey is, is that, like, not everything is black and white. You're coming from this character, and obviously this character is like a, a, my stand-in or any of our stand-in as a fish out of water, right? As a Black man in society, I can go into somewhere, and I can be high-level, intelligent, whatever, whatever, right? But mm -hmm. there are still people who are looking at me like, that's a Black man. So mm -hmm. there's something a little bit different, right? Something a little bit off. And uh, growing up, I could have felt one way, but once I get into the world, I've got to adjust to the world. Previously, Justice has never had to adjust to the world, right? Mm -hmm. He He's an angel, right? So he's sent on missions. He does his thing. He does whatever his calling is, but he's never had to, like, necessarily interact on a person-to-person -person level with humanity, with the Earth, right? Um, and so that's got to change everything. One of the biggest, again, going from a mythological Christian background, one mm -hmm. of the biggest and most powerful things we got is choice, right? The choice right. between right and wrong, good and evil, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, and so he's never really had to engage in that and engage in the nuance and realize that, hey, everything isn't all what it seems in heaven, nor is it in hell, right? Like, right. There are players and pieces moving at all times between all of them. And, you know, what's the ultimate right? What's the ultimate wrong? Well, that's, 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 that's the key. That's the secret. Everybody has their own motivations, like all these other things. Um, are always moving and are always constant and always in flux. Uh, and he's also, regardless of his status and stature, he's someone that people count out, right? Like right. he's a, like a trained dog. Hey, we tell him to go here, he goes here. We tell him to go here, he goes there. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. Um, and he's learning more than that. He's learning that like, maybe that's not the way this stuff should go mm -hmm. and, and, and gleaning knowledge from all of that. Uh, and so, again, a, a lot of the people and a lot of the players, things that I've mentioned, you, I talk about the Lords of the Firmament, which is an invention that has no basis in in fiction, right, really, like, or, you know, or in mythology, really, my own invention, but they're, it's very important. And who are they? And what do they do? And what is their main function? Those are you some stole, of the things that... You're stealing one of my questions, brother. God damn it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, nah, but it's fine because it, it, it's good that we're going there and, mm -hmm. and the fact that like I, I i never i never wanted to view justice as being someone that is naive yeah but in issue three i felt that way because yeah. you know it's it's uh, yeah understandably so he didn't see it coming yeah but for somebody who has literally been a soldier from jump mm -hmm. and being who he is to get betrayed in such a mm -hmm. way by Dante, who he yeah. probably viewed as not a threat, mm -hmm. almost seemed to me as how the fuck did he not know? <laughs> you know, I, and uh, so my thing is always, I feel like those people that are so, they hold tightly to one ideal. Mm-hmm that they can't fathom the other okay. at the moment, right? At Justice's moment, he can't fathom that after all this time, after Dante not being able to get back to Beatrice, right? After Dante not go, like, because uh, it's Dante from Dante's Inferno, right? Like, yeah. I'm using the same character. Right. So for him to not have retrieved his love at, at this point, because of his character still, mm -hmm. right? Justice really can't fathom that, like, he doesn't understand that. But I also tried to play a little bit of duality. And you see that in him when he meets with La Muerte, right? Like, there, obviously, there's more to her than meets the eye. Yeah. But he doesn't even understand what he's asking. Like, yo, are you going to be here when I get back? And she's like, am I ever? But she is, though, right? Right. <laughs> she's in her place. She's always wherever she is. But he doesn't get that part of it. Like, is she waiting for me? Should I be waiting for her? Do we need to have another conversation? Again, he's so single-minded yeah. and on the and on the war tip, right? And on the battle. If you remember Justice Zero, the first thing he does, he lands and he goes to Morningstar immediately. Hey fam, don't do this, don't do that. Because he's all about the war. He's mm -hmm. all about the battle. He's not about the nuance, right? Like he can understand it, but he's never had to up to this point. Up to this point, it's something's going on, something's bad. Y'all go over here and clean this shit up. Right. And you're dealing with people that are of his power level or beings, excuse me, not people, but beings that are of his power scale. So mm -hmm. he doesn't have to, again, deal with the nuance and the emotion of the, in number three. When he's fighting with Jareth, who turns into a dragon, he's fighting with the dragon and the dragon's like, you don't understand love. And he's like, you know, what I mean? he does it. He's, yeah. Oh, you would destroy this whole world for love. And the dragon's like, yeah, I burn this whole bitch down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. And that's how that's a, that's an emotion that he's never been exposed to, right? Mm -hmm. When he's talking to the you know the the, the chocolate partyist, obviously, like my little cameo that I got there, right? He doesn't understand him. He's like, oh yeah, well, he's as as he's being told what's going on or what happened in the past and why we're at where we're at, and he's seeing these great heroes in chains. He's like, well, why didn't y'all stand up? And he's like, bro, we did. <laughs> We just did it wrong. Like, we failed, right? Right. And even though knowing that justice himself has failed, he still doesn't understand, like, well, you know what I mean? It, it, it's still, mm -hmm. they're still missing pieces. Um, and I think that is 
the journey of discovery, right, of oneself, of one's motivations, of all of those things. And I think it's important that he doesn't know. Uh, you and I have talked, and I've been very critical of this. Superman goes somewhere and he punches something, and that's how they end everything, right? Like it always ends with him punching something, and that's mm -hmm. how we win. Yep. Um, I think it's important that a character that's supposed to be as powerful as Justice or a Superman or whatever, um, the battles are more than just punching something. Like it's the battle is the internal, the battle is the choice, the battle, like it's the Neo thing, right? Like, why do you keep fighting us? Because I choose to. It's the choice of of where we're gonna stand and how we're gonna understand um these right. concepts that are a lot of times even bigger than we are. No, that the, the and and that's a that's a fact. Um, and it's understandably so that pretty much in any of those type of comic forms, the the person with the biggest OP always has an indifference of who they actually are. Mm -hmm. You know them as the superior being. Yeah, he has the power of a thousand suns. Yeah. Yeah, but he's totally conflicted. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like he's a loony bin. And he has to yeah. sit on his couch watching TV because that's yeah. the only way to keep him calm. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And it's so it's it's one of those things that's like, especially in indies, right? Because nobody's indie character wants to get beat up by somebody else's indie character. We always want to be the greatest. I see people sometimes that are like, oh, this guy, he's unbeatable. He's he's so strong that he controls time and space and matter and energy. I'm like, well, then how does he lose? Like, how is this even a fight, right? Like, there's a reason right. Galactus doesn't come out in many comics, right? Because he's too powerful. Right. Like, you've got to write them differently and do different things. Um, and that doesn't happen a lot of times. But I feel like, again, as an exploration even of myself, um, that when Justice doesn't understand... Well, okay, there are a couple things that are thematic and they're elements, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think in Black society in general, women have always been... The driving force in America is what I would say, right? Like, right. because we had no choice. Man, men couldn't be a driving force. They killed us for that, right? We had to do this certain thing. So our culture, culturally speaking, they have been a super strong part and a super strong element and a guiding force and a nurture and all these things, right? right. So when I have Volante, when I have, um, when I have La Muerte, when I have, why can I call up her name right now? Billy. Right. Yeah, Billy. They represent these different aspects of what justice needs in order to move forward. That don't all mean they're all love. Right. But again, that's his interpretation being naive. Again, right. coming from a place where his his memories of Volante are fractured and we'll find out why in the future. Right. So he's like, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I used to protect her. And she in number two, she's like, no, stupid. I like you. You served me yeah. <laughs> like I low key protected you. You could you know you know even, like, yeah, you could even go back to when you were doing Nightfall, where at the it basically in in the the descriptions of her in those pages, like when she came off on the screen for like the very first time, everybody our society thinks that okay, justice is pretty much going to save the day and everything like that, and then pretty much in the next coming pages, like hers kicking ass so much that she don't even want to deal with it. Like they're asking, yeah. her, can, can we get your help? We saw what you yeah. did, and she's like, I don't even, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I don't care. I got, I got my takeout food. I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, I want to go home. Right. Yeah, I wanted to go home. <laughs> right, right, right. So, and I feel like that though. I feel like those parts are very important, right? And I also feel like it's again, it's an allegory for what we're talking about. While the man who's supposed to be, you know, strong and in charge and doing things, is in chains. Yeah. The women have to step up and right and, and assist, and then he has to assist. Right? It's an yeah. allegory for everything we're talking about there, um, yeah. as well. It doesn't mean he's any less powerful. Doesn't mean he's any less strong. It does mean he's more of a target because he obviously is. And mm -hmm. it's those kinds of things again to me that make such a difference in storytelling. Right? Like you can make strong female characters, you can make strong male characters, you can make strong children as characters without diminishing anyone else and continuing this journey of like exploration, right? right. And and what's going to come of things, which I feel is very important. I feel like Justice in particular, his journey is a journey of discovery, of discovering like one, we get to discover how powerful he is and how deep this lore goes, but he gets to discover like the wool that was over his eyes in a religious context Mm -hmm. in a person-to-person -person context and on and on and on. And I think that that's what makes the storytelling, for me, that's what makes the storytelling fun. 
Because if I just wanted to, dude, he's an archangel. He wins every time. Like, I just beat up a monk's beagle. And he just, True. you know, lightning black. That's, that's whack. That doesn't, that's not what makes it engaging or makes him an engaging character. Yeah. Now, my my other question that, uh, because I, 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 of course, didn't think of him as naive in the beginning. I almost had this thought is, does Justice have OCD? <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, like oh. because he's so caught up in like his end goal that he's not cognizant yeah. of the shit that's happening around him. Like it, it, like I was looking at the fact that Kane had escaped, and it was like, mm -hmm. how do you not know? <laughs> yeah, right. So okay, so there are little, there are little things that I've dropped in in pieces that again I think that even the audience uh, doesn't notice. So. Um, if you look at the cover that's right behind you there, yeah. you see there's a little piece of the door open. Yes, I do. So that's an important piece, right? Oh, like, shit. And it's all it's all it's also the, the issue is called like the road to heaven, right? It's paved with good intentions, right? So it's all these like little things that like uh and, and the and the quote in there, if you open it up, is a George Carlin quote, and it's like Basically, I can't remember it verbatim, but basically he said he's like not worried about all hell breaking loose. He's worried about like a little piece of hell being open because that would be so much harder to detect. And so that's why the quote is there. The quote, right. again, if you read the book beginning to end a certain way and you take everything at face value, the quote tells you, OK, a little piece of hell got loose. It's harder to detect as justice doesn't realize it until like, wait a minute, where is this dude? Because I, because why would, why would an angel take notice of a demon? Right. Why yeah. would he take notice of someone who's cast out? He shouldn't until it's important until it's almost too late. Oh shit. What's happening. Right. You know what I mean? And that's, and to me, that's important. And again, I try to layer everything. Like I said, like the cover has the little sliver of the door open you know, the door to hell is open. And then the quote tells you, but again, you're not going to get that until later on, uh, you know, if, if at all sometimes. But then when you go back and you get to read it and you're like, oh shit, it was just like Justice. Oh, it was there in front of me the whole time. Damn. Yep. So the ultimate cliffhanger at the end of issue three, of course, Justice is in battle uh, with this goddamn mm -hmm. uh, ancient dragon that he's whooping ass and yet he's confused by everything he's saying. <laughs> yes. You know right. At the same, <laughs> at the same time, uh, Billy is wounded. By the time mm -hmm. he gets back down to her, and Volante yeah. is gone, and then mm -hmm. it all starts to conjure up in his mind that pretty much, you know, like he's 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 now seeing it. It was like, you know, Billy then basically like told him like it was it was this. It was like a it was like a pack of dogs. Uh, that that yeah. basically came out of nowhere, and he's like, "Oh shit!" You yeah. know, so like, at the end of the day, you know, he's sitting there with Billy having drinks and trying to woo his way into pers pursuing Volante that he that she'll go with him, and they could basically uh, talk about his plan of basically, you know, having her reach her full power scale. Mm -hmm. In that attempt, you know, yeah, he does getting in, getting into into that battle, and at the end of it, like this cliffhanger just overrides, and and that that's the thing that was the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger was like Justice having an oh shit moment. Mm -hmm. Like okay, like so, Asaria got me, Kane got me, Dante betrayed me. I went over there for nothing. I found out some shit, but at the at the same time, I was going to get all types of busted at, towards the end of this. So, like, ultimately, I understand that this this next issue is called the fall. Mm -hmm. Where do we lead to? Because now, is this the end of the arc? Or are we are we keeping yeah. this is the end of this arc? Okay, got yeah. You. So issue four is the end of the arc, and and uh, so one of the taglines is like all roads lead here, right? And so you see the ultimate point and i feel like okay as betrayed as justice felt or or seemed last issue to me he gets even more betrayed this issue mm. i feel like even though it's like wall-to-wall -wall action i feel like the 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 stakes and the scale are higher 
as is the pain felt. Uh, so again, at this point, I don't I don't mind spoilers because I want people to read it. I want people to enjoy it and see because knowing something and then reading something are completely different. Right. So obviously in issue four, he's got to confront Kane. He's got to confront Iscariot and he's got to confront Volante. Um, if you know anything about these historical figures, ex uh, except for Volante, which we've set up, you know, she's part of, you know, the heavenly bodies and whatever. Um, Kane is the first murderer, man. Yeah. And so Kane was cast out. Who cast Kane out? Kane is, you know what I mean? Like it's always been an angelic kind of thing. The angels had to cast him out, blah, blah, blah. Same for Adam and Eve um, in the garden. I've said multiple times in writing, like, Justice is the angel that stood with a flaming sword in front of the garden, right? So what does that mean? That means he knows, like, again, we know he knows Cain. He's the one who cast Cain out. So there's a depth there that makes a difference, right? And as the angel in charge of justice, <clears throat> the archangel in charge of justice, who is the one who, who, who cast out again or would not admit Iscariot? Justice. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. these people have history and that's why they have history and it's it's direct like i said this is justice's first time having to deal with humans day to day right, right. but he's come in and had to do his thing do his duty before um so there are multiple layers to how this is going to all play out again emotionally and, and how that sort of betrayal goes um and again justice's duty to humanity and duty to his duty so there are a lot of uh, overarching layers to what's going to happen you've got to see why Iscariot and Kane are here which Iscariot kind of told you an issue too why he wants to do what he wants to do um G Kane kind of tells you an issue three they want to be the lords under the firmament right makes right. sense man silence God you can do what you got to do right like have, hell can't touch you you've said it already right Hell can't touch Iscariot. Hell can't touch Cain because God has said nobody touches Cain, basically, right? Um, and so here we are, uh, and you've got to see that come to a head and how that kind of plays out. Um, you also, like you said, you have Billy at you know kind of death's door. So what happens there? Right. What, what's the emotional impact of all of that? There are a ton of things that are moving at the same time. I feel like moving at like the speed of life, um, and it's important to bring those elements back in. So you have a full story, you have a full character where, uh, again, your strong guy or your powerful person is only as powerful as his mind can conceive, which for him is taking more time, right? In terms of, I think it would be too easy if he knew everything. If this dude is Sherlock Holmes yeah. plus Superman, like what's what's the fun there? What's what's the, what does he gain? Uh, what can he lose? Nothing. He's got to have, not necessarily a flaw, but he's got to have depth. He's got to have something. Um, and that's my something, him to be questioning what's going on and, and, and questioning who's really playing this chip. Like, okay, in issue two, um, you see Morningstar is playing backgammon. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's a game of strategy, right? right. So what, again, who's, who's on the other side of this game? Right. We don't know, right? Justice certainly doesn't fucking know. Justice doesn't even know he's in the game half the time. Exactly. He still thinks it's a war, right? Like, and it's and it's different. So um, that's what makes the journey important. That's what makes it fun. That's what makes it the that's what makes the story, not just the beat em up action. Um, the story is where are we really going with all this? And um heading out of issue four and leading into issue five, man. It's just we dropped something today on one of the updates. Um, so again, it's not a spoiler, but issue Don't five speak on it. is justice versus. <laughs> Don't speak on ah! it. Don't speak uh, over uh, more questions. All right. So uh, okay. before you I'm get into that, <laughs> we, uh, yeah. before you get into that, because you touched on it okay. briefly, um the concept of the Lords of Under the Firmament um is almost looked at as an empty chair with Cain mm -hmm. and Iscariot. Like, what exactly does that give you? So if you are and it's in, in my opinion, it's their their invention, right? But if you are a lord or the lord under the firmament, you rule earth. You have dominion excuse me, over everything under the firmament, right? Mm -hmm. Again, because, it, it, and I would assume that only certain people can have that, right? These people would also have to have immunity, either immunity or allegiance with hell, okay. right? 
So if you're Iscariot or Cain, again, Iscariot has been refused by heaven and refused by hell. That's why he is your first vampire. That's why he is what he is, right? Yeah. So um, he's uh he's Shang Kane, Sun. he's Shang Tsung. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he again, exactly right. He's an outcast. Um, Kane is basically the same way. So if you are if you're in that position, right? Hell can't touch you. Now all you got to do is silence heaven. Now they can't touch you. So you are a kingdom unto your own. Mm. Uh, in this, in this again mythological tiered system. Right. of of deities right you may have to right. con at that point you may have to contend with other deities who knows right but the ultimate power of good and the ultimate power of evil can't touch you so you're in charge you can run everything mm. um, and that's the position they want to be in um, like, again at least on this plane right that doesn't include hell that doesn't include like Tartarus and, and the thing where we saw justice going in issue three but everything on this mortal coil is their purview should they take that? You know what I mean? Should right. they be able to silence the two groups that are fighting now? Mm. Now, okay. Issue five. Mm -hmm. Going into the next arc. Yeah. Also, because of the many that was at, at the end of this book, yeah. you got a, well, not, I can't even say an introduction because it wasn't an introduction on my end. It's a caliber. If anybody yeah. has never seen him for the first time. Mm hmm ultimately where this leads because of the update that you just put up issue, mm -hmm. issue five caliber no, number two is a head-to-head -head. yes it's your yes two, it's your two top guys who of course know each other from nightfall it's not mm -hmm. like they're totally oblivious of each other they're not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are now caught up in the same game mm -hmm. and does this does this mini that that was maybe like I'd say five six pages long. Yeah. Uh, does that have anything to do with that? Has everything to do with it. So, Caliburn has run as a basically a backup feature in every issue of Justice. Yeah. So Justice issue one, you got the first four pages of Caliburn number one. Mm -hmm. Justice issue two, the next six pages. Justice number three, the next six pages. So we're gonna end just uh, sorry Caliburn number one in Justice number four. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have the full 22 page comic after number four is all out so it can right. ship by itself. Um, and so that's why it'll be uh, justice number five and caliber number two. That is a dual issue. Right. Uh, where they're going head to head and everything that's happened and everything you've seen caliber in, in in terms of justice one through four leads directly into what happens. Yeah. In justice that, number five slash caliber number two. Because at the end of this issue, the the mini that was in here, it's almost like Caliburn was witnessing an exorcism. Oh, he definitely is. Hundred percent is. And it gets even even crazier in the next one. So I've always said Caliburn, his catchphrase is like hunting the darkness is my business and business is good. He's basically like a demon bounty hunter, but not he's not like a cop necessarily, right? He's right. a demon destroyer for lack of better words. Um, and so uh Caliburn, all the pages, the collected pages of issue one, you're on one of his cases uh, where he is he is tasked to hunt down um, this demon. And again, at the end of issue one, you see again, at, at the end of issue one, it leads into issue two and it's Justice issue five. That's the one thing I don't want to give spoilers about. Right. That's the only one, right? Because um, it's really cool. But uh, again, it's, it's one of those things that all roads lead here. We've gone a little bit out we're going to come back in and then in the next arc we're going to do the same we'll go back a little bit out and go back in um mm -hmm. and everything ostensibly in the wingless universe is connected in some form or fashion and as right. we roll out scarlet knight and avery the astonishing number two and her number two and immortalis number two everybody will see that like there's connectivity through each one there's only about two degrees three degrees of separation between all these characters and even so like within these roster of characters you look at Look at her and Avery the Astonishing. And even though we touched on it briefly before we started, Immortalis being a fictional historical uh, historical comic, and for Avery to be another OP character, her being uh, essentially a multifaceted, I would say, uh, character that's, that's brilliantly written by Malachi, to bring those, those type of personalities into a theme 
with Justice and Caliburn of how it's really dark. And there's an underworld beseeching a lot of this. How do you make those people fit into that theme? Because they may not seem overall to for people that have read read a lot of the comics mm -hmm. that you have in the Wingless Stable yeah. to be a part of this universe. Um, so a, a lot of conversations were had in the background uh, okay. initially, and uh, I will say the initial ones with with Malachi were a little difficult, right? Because we were both finding our feet. And trying to say, hey, I'm going to tell this story. I want to tell that story. One of the things that I initially said, and this is kind of what smoothed, not smoothed it over, but made it easy for everybody is, and I will say this on record, every deity, every mythology, every angel, every all of that stuff, it's all equal to me, right? Mm -hmm. And in this world, it's all equal. What we have is we have a high, high creator. Now, that creator goes by a bunch of different names, depending on your religious context, yeah. depending on your scientific beliefs, whatever. To me, that's not important because I'm not peddling religion, right? I'm peddling stories. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a lowest low evil person. What their motivations are, again, depends on your religion, your context, your science, blah, 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 whatever. We've got these. So that's all you need. You got a force of creation and a force of destruction, basically. They go by different names, go by different principles, whatever. Um, and I build a lot of that stuff out as we tell the story. Uh -huh. That's the, the original part of it. But that means that Orishas, that means that Bantu gods, that means Mesoamerican ah, okay. gods, all of this stuff. Yeah. Right? We call the Christians call them angels. Uh, the Norse called them the Aesir. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. on and on and on. None of that. It, I don't. I don't make a difference. Um, and one is greater than the other. No, no, no. Like the character might be because this is the character's hierarchy in our universe. But that makes everything plain so that no one has to worry about, oh, well, my belief or my whatever is going to be shit on. Right. No. Stop that right there. The next part of it is, um, I will say Brett is really brilliant. Brett had come to me with Immortalis maybe six or eight months before we even launched or even announced it. And he was like, I got an idea. I think it'll work for the wingless universe. Give me a little bit of time. I had legitimately forgotten about it. And then he shot me the script to Immortalis. And I was like, this is perfect. Right. Right. Because it sets up history. It sets up lore. And there are so many ways that we can work it in. Um, and that's what that boils down to. Her uh, represents, I guess, in what, what in Marvel would be like, oh, we got the science and then we got the this and we got the that. There's not much difference in terms of theme. Mm -hmm. uh, of any of the stories, right? Themes are themes, but with her, we get to explore a different side of things. While her is powerful, while her is an elemental, while her has these things going on, right? She's not dealing with the threats that justice is. They're different tiers. Right. That doesn't mean again, that doesn't mean one is better than the other. That's not it. But this dude is dealing with the quote unquote cosmic, right? But on a mm -hmm. on a base level, she's dealing. Her is dealing more with, um, I, I don't know how to compare it, but I would say like the mutant threat, right? Like yeah. the mutant level threat, mm -hmm. um, in this same plane. Uh, Scarlet Knight is going and, and Caliburn, right? Caliburn comes from the sword Excalibur. Like these are yeah. etymological names, right? So if you got a knight and a knight, you know they're going to be dealing with something similar. And how far you got Merlin in there? So Merlin also is a uh, a bond to both like the ethereal and the mutant level and the night level and the mystic right. and you know what i mean so all of them kind of mesh in and out and and even avery avery being a little bit their avery's origin being a little bit different right in issue one mm -hmm. but coming into the wingless universe she knows jinx okay so that means she knows military with you know what i mean and uh, yeah just these little pieces that you can kind of put together well, not staring, stay. You don't have to stay married to an idea. This isn't Superman. We don't, every time we mention him, he's from Krypton, the planet blew up, the rocket ship, blah, blah, blah. When we're only in issue one and issue two, we don't have to have an established origin of that sort that we have to stick to. Mm -hmm. We can mold it for the storytelling that we're doing. The, the character might be visually a visual spectacle and someone that we can see and, and, and kind of recognize. But they're still clay. We still have a lot of time to play with them. Um, right. And the important part for me was building out this world that other people could play in. Hey, here's the world. It's dark. When did it become dark? I don't know. Hey, Brett comes in. Hey, how about it went dark after Rome? That was the last piece. 
okay, hey, man, that's perfect, because then I can say mm -hmm. what happened in slavery, right, which is a question I get, well, where was justice during slavery? And justice's reply would be, like, sometimes we fight, and sometimes we lose. Like, that was a dark period. Like, we, heaven was getting its ass kicked for a long time. Yeah. Now we're finally turning the tide of battle, right? And that's why I'm so fierce about it. Um, and so that we can address some of those things. But it gives, again, it gives us a historical context. Oh, hey, what are we going to do moving into the future? And what about this? And what about that? Oh, well, okay, we have her and we have Avery and we have Lux and we have all these other characters that we can take to address building out this world so that it seems authentic as opposed to just, oh, here's my Green Lantern Superman character and here's my Spawn character yeah. and here's my batman character you know what i mean no yeah. bro like let's make a universe and actually make it interconnected and make the storytelling um like a visual spectacle so even at times where you just get a little cameo of somebody you're like oh shit that's oh, okay yeah. they are in the same city that i feel like that's just a, a more effective efficient and fun version of doing what we do yeah you you have people nowadays um and i i, I think i've heard it often is they they perceive the act of superhero comics as an American mythology. Mm -hmm. that we've had the opportunity, uh, aside from people, I guess, back in uh, Roman times or in ancient Greek times, uh, basically spewing out these exaggerated characters. And mm -hmm. even if you look at like tall tales and legends, like the, the whole character of like a Paul Bunyan being... Yeah you know, 18 feet tall and was walking around with a blue bull the entire time. Yeah, you know, right. There may have been like an extremely tall dude in Montana one day. Kinda. And he had a bull that was like probably just the size of him. And, right. and it probably got so exaggerated because there was no internet or anything like that. You probably couldn't even yeah. tell. Pictures. It was like it, that tale probably got halfway to Missouri from where he was at, where they told it first. And it was like mm -hmm. there's 18 foot tall dude in Montana. Right. I saw him. Right. Right. Or my, or my boy told me about him, you know. Right. And, it, and it's real. And his and his bull was probably had a blue hue to it. Exactly. It right. Look, look, black fur under the sun. Yeah, that's it. The right way. It looks blue. Right. right? Yeah, it exactly. looks blue. So, I, look, right. I, and I, I think that's one of the things. OK, so people get into this superhero comic genre thing, which obviously I know. And it started for X amount of reasons. But that's when you get the comparisons of like that to manga or whatever. And it's like they're both telling superhero OP stories. They are. Right? It's just, again, how it's done, how it's restarted, um, what's important. And especially for me, a lot of indies don't get to, indies love comics. They do. But they don't get to, to the heart of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's partially because of their love. Oh, I love it, so I know it. Um, oh, I, know, I have a story I want to tell. Okay, yeah, but that doesn't make you a writer. It's a craft thing. It's like, oh, I'm a, I'm an artist. I want to draw it. But people will very quickly be like, oh, go and study this. You're not an artist. You know what I mean? Like, or, or your art needs to improve or whatever else. People rarely do that with writing because they'll be, I can tell my own story. Yeah, you can. But it doesn't mean it has the mechanical meat necessary mm -hmm. to make it like a good story. Uh, and, and that's what happens with a lot of superhero comics and especially indies. People have this character that they've had since they were 15 and it looks cool maybe. But they haven't developed like the first thing and everybody who I edit for every single one of them. Why? Why? Every every page. But why though? But why are they doing that? Well, because I well, cause, nah, don't give me because of, right? Don't right. give me, well you, well, you didn't know that. Okay, if I didn't know, nobody knows. Why are we doing this? Um, and that's a lot of the piece that gets missing. I even think in some mainstream comics again. Oh yeah. If we're even though people hate it when Batman Batman plummeted from space into Earth, right? And they were like, "That's impossible." It is, but they also gave you the why. They explained it as he's falling, right? Like they gave you the why of it, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it like even the slightest bit plausible and acceptable. They gave you the why. Yeah, um, even if and, it was an exaggerated, like the shit don't fucking make sense. But right, gave you a why. Right. And that's the thing. I think that's one of those things that I've been reading like a lot of Gundam uh, material. Like I love the Gundam oh, yeah. series, all of them. But I started, I was like, man, I want to read a Gundam novel and see what's up. Bro, they started talking about GN particles. And I was like, is this real science? I had to go look, right? But they base it in something to where, even though, like you said, they're extrapolating, right? Like they're taking this thing. And they're, right. But it, again, it gives you the why and it gives you stakes and it gives you reasons to be there. And that's, 
wingless comics no other comic company no other indie comic company is giving you a why we're giving you a why they're doing this why are we superheroes we don't have a scene we'll ne there will never as long as i live be a scene where someone's like superhero time and like get to it nah bro like this that's that's there's a why that needs to happen but look at how many indie comics do that well i guess i better do the superhero thing or i better go and save this like come on bro right. like no if your con character is co comedic like that that's different but you're trying to be a serious comic and you're like i better go check that alley for dangerous criminals like this ain't the 50s bro like right. tell a story give us the why why did he happen to be an alley why did justice happen on to Billy in issue one? Because she screamed bloody murder. He yeah. wouldn't have seen her. Dan was chilling on a gargoyle. But there's a reason that that balloon, you know what I mean? That talk balloon comes up that, that righteous because it's a point to it. There is a why. Um, and again, that's what we try to excel at with Wingless Comics. We try to excel at the why so that we're giving you a good story. We're giving you meat. We're giving you something to like grab on. Because again, I want you after issue three, like, I want you to be like, hey, Brian, where's issue four? Like, you left me with this yeah. cliffhanger. Give me issue four. And now we was talking about issue four, and you don't even know the ending, but we talk about issue five. I'm giving you the teaser for issue five. Like, yo, you got to mm -hmm. see why these dudes are the top two. Why are they going at each other? Right. That's important. That's storytelling. That's engaging your audience. And that's actually like, you know, giving a shit beyond I want to be the next Marvel or sell my IP or, you know what I mean? Like, that kind of a thing. That's what's happening. Bro, always amazing to have you aboard. I know it took us a long time to get here, but we did. <laughs> right. <Burn. laughs> no, you so. know, again, man, I, I'll say it every time. And I tell other people this. I really honestly, like, your show is natural. I really appreciate being here. And I feel like every comic creator that's been on here should appreciate the authenticity of just having these conversations from a person who's not like an elitist comic book head, is not trying to peddle their own comic themselves or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it's just genuinely for the love of of what we do. Uh, I wouldn't be in certain places and in certain rooms without our podcast. You know no, what I mean? That, without us being able to talk about stuff. So I appreciate it tremendously. That's for sure. Because just like you, I want to know the why. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bro, it makes everything, right? It's not, again, what is always going to be. And this is what, real quick, this is what's missing or what has been missing from like Fast and the Furious, but what I think they really got right in number 10. Say what you want about number 10, it still had all those stunts and all the crazy stuff, right? Jason Momoa gave you a dope ass why. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they filled in all those gaps. Alan Rickson gave you a dope ass why so that you want to come back. I feel like this one, I've wanted to come back more than any of the other previous ones because he gave you the why and you want, and now that I have the why, now I want to see what. Right. Now I want to see what's going on or what's going to happen. We know these are stories, right? Very few stories in bad. The hero wins. This is how we tell stories um, because it's not reality. It's not real life. So now that I have a good why and I'm invested in this why, now I want to know what happens. And I try again to take that same storytelling tact of like, okay, now I've given you a why. Yep. Now what's going to happen? You know what I mean? And so that's that's everything in storytelling to me. As it should be. Bro, amazing. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, what is it? Justice 4 now has two weeks left. Yes, sir. Tw uh, 12 days, I think, to be exact. Last time I checked, we're just over uh, 6,500. Again, like I said, we announced um, at 7K, we are adding the Justice versus Caliburn print to all physical backers. Everybody will get it. Um, we're still on the march to 10k y'all i will definitely have a big surprise when we hit 10k um and yeah yeah again 12 days all the time in the world damn gotta love indie comics brian thank you for being here man this was amazing uh for james grandmaster facts boys brian lambert wingless comics justice go out there and get that on kickstarter right now definitely good to have you again and we are out <laughs>